I'd like to thank Sages for the privilege of the podium. Today I will be discussing upper esophageal sphincter disorders, the classic manometric findings. These are my disclosures, none of which are specifically related to this talk. By way of upper esophageal sphincter disorders, the first thing to think about really are the anatomic considerations, and this is certainly not an easy anatomic region of the body to comprehend. Number one, it's asymmetric in that its long axis is horizontal, as you can see in the image. The anterior pressures, uh, anterior posterior pressures are higher, and really the highest pressures occur at the upper cricopharyngeus. There's rapid upward movement during swallow, which when you place pH probe catheters or manometry catheters, for instance, it displaces that catheter due to that rapid upward movement, which is why I prefer solid state catheters, if at all possible. The frequency of upper esophageal sphincter disorders is around 3% of all manometry reports in patients sent for manometry for other indications. Unfortunately, there is not a great classification system for these disorders. Uh, it is not specifically included in the Chicago classification or others at this time. There are, however, some upper esophageal sphincter parameters that we utilize to differentiate potential disorders. We examine and look at baseline pressure, relaxation time, residual pressure, coordination of uh, swallow and pressures with contraction, the amplitude, um, as well as the intrabolus pressures, and we'll talk about some of those moving forward. The baseline pressure, uh, a typical manometric finding we investigate, can range anywhere from 100 to 150 millimeters of mercury. Baseline pressure can be increased compared to normal when patients are experiencing stress or when they're trying to talk during their um, manometry study. Certainly crying, tears, anything that increases the pressure in the anterior posterior direction. Other things that will increase the baseline pressure includes downstream pressure. So if their esophagus and the cricopharyngeus is squeezing against an obstruction, for instance, that will increase the pressure at baseline. Alternatively, decreased baseline pressure may be due to catheter-related issues or the pull of the thyrohyoid muscle, as uh, you recall from the image of the anatomy I showed previously. So what then is the value of the baseline pressure? Well, um, one such study revealed that really the value is that the increased pressure compared to baseline is suggestive of globus sensation or potentially muscular disorders. In other words, in patients with known muscular disorders, we may see increased baseline pressure, or in those who present with globus sensation, the same finding. Other manometric findings include sphincter relaxation with a range of 0.3 to 1 seconds, and that depends on the device utilized and the patient's physiology. The residual pressure, uh, which ranges between 8 and 15 millimeters of mercury, has some potential utility, and I highlight that here. When you see a residual pressure that's above 15 millimeters of mercury, it may suggest a high downstream resistance example would include a Zenker's diverticulum as the upper esophageal sphincter tries to squeeze against a potential obstruction. Another option that would increase residual pressure is impaired relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter. So in patients who have uh, medullary lesions or Parkinson's disease or other myopathies, they may not be able to adequately relax their upper esophageal sphincter, so not only would their residual pressure be higher, their baseline pressure may be higher as well. Um, anterior traction of the upper esophageal sphincter, again potentially due to diverticulum um, or cancer, may be a, a reason for increased residual pressure and finally large bolus swallows. 
So what is the potential value of monitoring the residual pressure? Well, again, in patients with muscular disorders and globus sensation, we see increased residual pressures. As for intrabolus pressure, you can again see the normal range here. When we see um, variability in the intrabolus pressure, it's often due to the size and the consistency of the bolus. And while consistency of the bolus may be something that can be controlled, sometimes size is more difficult to control. The incidence of upper esophageal sphincter disorders is roughly 30 to 50 percent of patients who are ultimately referred for high resolution esophageal manometry. This is noted in several recent studies uh, published in the gastroenterology literature. Impaired relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter is really most common as far as the disorder type. About 7 to 14 percent show increased incidence of type 2 achalasia with upper esophageal sphincter abnormalities. And impaired relaxation of upper esophageal sphincter and type 2 achalasia predicts poor responses to treatment. And you can see in this article published in the Journal of Ga Clinical Gastroenterology in patients uh, with upper esophageal dysfunction, 80% um, of them uh, did not have improvement in treatment of achalasia. Or more simply say, stated, in patients with upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction with achalasia, 80% of them failed to improve with treatment for that achalasia. Dysphagia is really the most common presenting symptom of upper esophageal sphincter disorders. Again, looking at the manometric readings, specifically residual pressure, we see that residual pressure is increased in esophageal outlet obstruction, particularly highest in type 2 achalasia, as noted in this study. It really segregates achalasia subtypes from EGJ outlet obstruction in patients with known esophageal outlet obstruction. And so what you see in this table here where we're looking at upper esophageal uh, sphincter findings, in patients whose dominant symptom is dysphagia, the largest portion is that their upper esophageal sphincter findings on manometry suggest a hypertensive sphincter. Um, that's also true in patients with GERD or with hiccups, but it, so it is not specific, um, but it is the most common presenting symptom of UES. When you look at high resolution esophageal manometry results in patients with achalasia, you can see about 50% of them have upper esophageal sphincter findings that are hypertensive, while Another 50%, the other half, have either hypotensive or impaired relaxation. Globus sensation is the other relatively common presenting symptom in patients with upper esophageal sphincter disorders. Isolated globus sensation is really the most uncommon. It's about 10% of the time. Uh, as globus sensation often goes along with some other type of symptom such as dysphagia. The UES length is really less than normal in the majority of these patients and you can see on the high resolution esophageal manometry here the normal HRM study versus patients who present with uh, globus sensation. You can see the total EUS length appears less than normal. In addition, the baseline pressure may be less than normal, but is higher than in patients who present with dysphagia. 
the residual pressure on HRM is greater than normal, but also greater than in patients with dysphagia. So utilizing uh, upper esophageal sphincter length, less than normal, and residual pressures that are not only higher than normal, but even higher than patients with dysphagia, may correlate well in patients with globus sensation. So while this is interesting from a diagnostic standpoint, what treatments do we have for upper esophageal sphincter uh, disorders? Well, given that dysphagia is the most common presenting symptom and that dysphagia is of the UES is often related to downstream dysfunction, the treatment is often aimed at alleviating that downstream dysfunction. Whether that's a dysmotility, whether it's a um, outlet obstruction, or an anatomic issue. Other treatment modalities that have uh, been proven to be effective in select patients is biofeedback, dilation for those anatomic issues that would benefit from such a thing, Botox, particularly of the cricopharyngeus, and this is most commonly presented in the ENT literature. Um, additional ENT publications look at the utility of Botox to improve quality of life scores related to dysphagia that can't be treated with one of the other modalities I've mentioned previously. And then finally is cricopharyngeal myotomy. This is usually reserved for patients who have hypertensive upper esophageal sphincter related to muscle disease uh, and or brain disease leading to this type of a hypertonic state. So in summary, a uh, firm grasp and, and review for many of us um, of anatomy and manometry are really required to understand upper esophageal sphincter function as well as dysfunction. Because the UES disorders are not really fully understood, they're not exactly classified by current systems, and these disorders suggest concomitant esophageal dysfunction. So when you see them, you may have a higher um, consideration for other esophageal dysfunction that is resulting in these upper esophageal sphincter disorders. And ongoing studies look to correlate really manometry findings with concomitant disease and treatment outcomes, and that is ongoing at this time.